Hello and welcome back to Disco Elysium. So, we have a few quests which have updated since last time, because we've got some other stuff to do with them. Now, this one, Damage Ledger, we have an extra clue about. That's in our um, inventory. In Central Furnace, I don't know why we can access, or we, why we've got an extra positive on that, but we, we can try it again. So, we should try it again. Uh, I'm going to go in there first. Just to see what's going on. So this is the furnace which I suspect Kuno uses as a hiding spot at some point. Yeah, we're not entirely sure what's going on in here, but this was for the curse quest. Okay, so it's up here past the bear. Yeah. Okay, it's this furnace. Okay. Um, Because I wet my whistle. Oh, because I, cause I drunk something. I can now do this again. Oh, nice. Let's try it. As another fail. Another pathetic yelp sounds off into the vast darkness of the chimney. You're a little embarrassed you produced it. I guess we'll get another health back then. Alright, so that was just a straight up failure. Yep. That, um... That wasn't so good. Are we staggering a little bit? I was wondering if we're staggering because we've been drinking. But, yeah, probably not. Anyway, so, that one was a fail. The other one is the damage ledger, which is in here. So I go to interact. Uh, I go and get our damage ledger. Let's have a look. So, open the hidden compartment in the clipboard. Let's go. Just relax. The two sides of the board are slightly misaligned. Like a drawer that's come off the slides, all you need to do is bend the plastic on your knee slowly and the slides snap back into place. It should be possible to just, you know, slide the drawer open. Without resistance or sound, the two panels move against each other. The compartment is now open. What's inside? Two ticket stubs and a handmade postcard. Picket stubs? What the- what's the third one? Um, no, I don't think we're going to do that. Um, pick up the ticket stubs. Two octopuses are smiling, reaching their tentacles towards each other in the coloured pencil drawings. The tickets per, um, permit access to a zoo in the Revish, in Revishol East. The aquarium costs extra. These let you go there too. Ooh, and the card? Thin wax paper has been glued to a piece of cardboard. Sounds like leaves rustling when you pick it up. You see violet flowers, floral patterns, patches of glue. Smell it. It smells of chewing gum. Apricot flavoured. A touch of cinnamon. The end of summer. You think the label says Tutti Fruity. Open it. Familiar handwriting lines the inside of the card. Looped, round letters in a woman's hand. A young woman in her twenties. There is care, effort and a smile, you think. Although that is not something you can read from someone's handwriting. Harry. It begins. You're already reading. I wanted to write you a letter, so you can read it when you wake up. Maybe it will make you happy. Throw it away, please, or volition. But it will make me happy. A merciful wind blows in from the Bay of Revishal, dusting the ground at your feet and raising newspapers far away. You feel the card slipping into it. Hold on to it. Read the card. Your hands shake, holding on to it. Every morning, when I step out and you're asleep behind me, it says, I find a little piece of sadness in me. I carry it in my chest down Voyager Road. Every step I take, it grows. By the time I reach the fuel station, it has filled me entirely. I step on the light rail and look back. Sparks fall from the bow collector. I know it will be like this until late afternoon, when I get off the 49 and walk back to you. Keep reading. You, you, every step I take will get lighter. It almost makes me run. Sometimes I do. I can't believe I met you. I can't believe this happiness I feel with you. You all, you have a vast, vast soul and I will always, 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 always come back to it. Kisses, kisses, kisses. You feel the air sucked out of your lungs and the blood sucked out of your head. Everything around you goes dark. Small white dots appear. You'll feel the ledger slip from your hand. No, no, hold on. Hold on. To what? There's nothing. Detective, is everything all right? I'm going to fall sideways.
Disco Elysium. Okay. This is the title card? That's a little weird. Wait. Wait a sec. No. Is the game restarting? It wasn't a game over, it's just a restart. There is nothing. No way. A game. Nothing? Nothing, sad brother. No treachery, just blackout. It's gonna lie there passed out. Well, almost nothing. There is the ground below you, that's still there. And the small light that's on, fluttering somewhere in the basal ganglia. Who's that? That's me. Blue eyes. That's me. Nice and quiet. Is it? The world is gone. You are no longer reacting to outward stimuli, yet still. A bitter caustic sense of loss remains. Even in the darkness, great sorrows slip in the water. Slimy. No, I was cool. I'm cool. The cool when you're dead, brother. Here in the paleomammalian cortex, we call it the shadow. Because it's always there. Tell them. Tell them. Ah, yes. And in the old factory system, they call it the apricot chewing gum scented one. It's unhealthy of them to linger on it so, but as they say, what do you do? smelled so nice. It didn't smell nice. It smelled like betrayal. Where is Voyager Road? There is no Voyager Road. There are no roads, no houses, no lights in the windows. It's all on. Pause. Was that the X something? The bloated corpse of the past resurfacing? No, it was beautiful. Beautiful. Believe me, stupid ape, its lack of beauty was not the problem. Enough. You think they would let you? Until you disintegrate into biomolecules? No. Someone is breathing on your face now, inspecting your pupils, stupid idiot. I'm not coming back. Oh, but you are. They're pouring something on you. In you. It's... It's delicious. Glowing lights on a dashboard emerge out of nothingness. Where am I? In the upholstered cabin of Lieutenant Kitsuragi's motor carriage, seated in the driver's basket. The air is thick with leatherworks and heavy fuel oil. Cold water runs down your chin. Drink water. Lieutenant is extending a small canister to your mouth. Okay. The water is cold. as slivery. The stuff of life itself. As it pours down your parched throat, the pounding in your head recedes and the darkness parts. Drink. He tilts the canister. You haven't drunk water in two days. Did you know the human body is not made to survive on alcohol alone? You need a secondary form of hydration. Alright, keep drinking. With greedy gulps, you down half a litre of cold water. Some of it spills on the driver's seat. The lieutenant pays no heed to it. Oh, what happened? I should ask you the same. You were reading your paperwork, then you passed out. I carried you to my kinema to take you to a hospital, then you came to. How long was I out? Oh, ten minutes, maybe. Well, I came into contact with the burnt-out ruins of the past, Lieutenant. Hmm, that does sometimes happen. We gained the ledger of failure and hatred. He hands you the remains of your ledger. He replies with such understanding, it's as if the burnt-out ruins of the past were an occupational hazard. Athletes' fruit for cops. You drop this. Are you okay to proceed? I'm just gonna nod. Good. 
The Ledger of Failure and Hatred is a special item that can be used both as an interactable and a tool equipped in your hand for skill bonuses. Find it under the tool section in your inventory. We had a new thought as well. White Morning. You see yourself from above. You're passed out on the blue tiles of the hostel floor, uh, room floor. Even from this distance, you can see your eyelids flutter. At mention of what? A great white object, letting out its sweet smell. Like a lily of the valley. The little man's forgotten its name, but he still remembers the feeling. And look, he moves. The feeling animates him, and he instinctively reaches out for the feeling's best friend. A bottle of Commodore Red. He puts on his disco clothes and gets smaller and smaller. Okay. Wow. So, the Ledger of Failure and Hatred gives us one Inland Empire, one Empathy, and minus two Authority. So, Inland Empire has got feeling, right? Yep. Empathy, we know what that one is. Authority is our well, authority. Okay, interesting. So, we could go down to a zero authority and get an Inland Empire and an Empathy. Guess we'll go with that for just now. But it is also an interactable, I believe. If I go... Wait, did it say it was an interactable? Oh yeah, I can interact it here. That's fine. Don't need to do any of that for just now. Let's leave it there. Right, and we also have the uh, instant photo of tattoos. An intricate web of blue lines stretches from the torso of the hanged man, from the right shoulder to the solar plexus. Each time the lines intersect, a small white star is formed in their crossing. Hundreds of fading asterisks, asterisks uh, riddle his skin. Their concentration is highest around his heart. It almost looks like the electrical patterns inside a radio computer or an old filament memory, but not quite. Who are you? Gone. What's the meaning of this tattoo? For you to discover, you've gotten as far as you will without assistance. Someone close to the victim might know. Someone who knows about history could tell you. Oh, okay. I'll put the photo away for just now. But we got some clues there. What's this? Snow covers the white and blue police livery of the motor carriage. The white colors nearly meld together. Wait, why am I even thinking about this? Wasn't I supposed to... Do something important? Something murder related? There's always something important. Doesn't mean you can't take a moment to admire this piece of machinery. This is the Cupris Kinema, the Cupris Motor Corps follow up to the highly successful workhorse, the Cupris 40, an answer to the Lums Racing Bread Fevra series. With his air cooled, rear mounted 12 cylinder compression ignition engine driving the rear wheels through a 4 speed manual gearbox, the Kinema is able to reach 100 uh, kilometers per hour in 13.5 seconds and go on to a top speed of 180 kilometers an hour. Um, wouldn't it roll over on the first sharp corner? The high center of balance is offset by a large battery bank mounted at the bottom of the cabin. Feeding all the auxiliary systems and making the Kinema, uh, the Kinema, effectively a mobile power plant. This tech talk is really rubbing me the right way here. Due to a quite steep price tag, it is very unusual to see one in police livery. Um, that machine really puts the local back in locomotion. Very cool. Hmm, Lieutenant Cop. Uh, Smiles ever so slightly. Want to take a closer look? Um, what's it packing there? Pointing to the engine. 130. An advancement of the KR18GU engine of the Cupris 40, to be precise. Ah, it must be an advancement of the KR18GU engine on the older 40 models, right? Yeah, you know it. Lieutenant seems surprised. Oh, just the basics. Cast iron blocks, with swirl, a swirl chamber ignition, dual chains, driving overhead camshafts, two valves per cylinder, hydraulic valve lash adjustment. Hmm, yes, that's uh, right. He stares at you in surprise. I am very impressed that you know these things. A fine machine. Yes. There's a gentleness in the lieutenant's voice as his eyes run over the vehicle contours. 
an extraordinary machine. It's nice and all, but why so modest? Put some zing in it, flare it up, slam it down. Helium headlights would improve the range and quality of the visuals field a lot. Ever thought about switching to helium headlights? Actually, I have a pair at home. I just haven't gotten around to fitting them yet. I need to lay some wiring for the ballasts first. Hey, if we ever get this case solved, maybe we can do it together. You want to help? He glances at you and smiles. Oh, thank you for the offer. That might be fun. Let's do the case first, though, all right? You like the idea? Well, that's good. We're, we're, we're becoming a little bit more friends with them. Okay. So, next thing that we need to do is actually at the motor. We need to call in something here. Uh, one of these we have to call in anyway. Run the number on the victim's armor. Yes. So, go to the car. Yep, yep, we saw this before. Um, I Tap on the fuel preheater gauge. As you tap on the gauge, the indicator pin jerks as if startled. Yes, we've seen this before. Anyway, pick the radio up. This is precinct 57. The operator greets you through the static. How may I assist you? Um, could you run a serial number from a pair of armored boots for me? Sure, officer. What's the number? And the uh, make of the armor, if you know it. E5100-1000. The make and model of the armor is Fairweather T500VE. Got it. I'll contact the ICP database immediately. Call back tomorrow. Hopefully they'll have dug up something useful by then. The International Collaboration Police, ICP, is an intersolary law enforcement service, the crown jewel in the moral intern diadem alongside EPIS and the coalition government. Okay. Well, that's fine. We'll leave it there. Right. So we've now sent that off so we can get that in a day. I need to do that. We've got so many other things. Right. Uh, we could go and interrogate the Wild Pines person about the tattoos, but she still has a job for us to do. So let's head east and find out what's going on over here. Because we keep heading east and then not getting very far. So what's up with this? Ooh, what are these? Bottle oh, there's money. Just off the ground. Free money. So we have this guy who's looking pretty uh, stylish up there. So that's the way into the harbor. Okay. Large man here. Hello. Bastards! We have a right to work! The man yells towards the harbor gates. His voice is loudest of a lot and oddly screechy for a man his size. What's going on here? Pull up and stay frosty, everyone! Cops are here! The broad-shouldered alpha male turns to you. He's a full head taller than everyone else here. You here to fuck with us? Beat the honest worker down? Why should I? We're here to fight for a cause! Stripes usually have problems with people who have causes. Okay then, I'm thinking no. Good! We're fighting for a cause here. Right to work! Right to work! Besides, we're not that different. It helps the people see us talking. Cops and strike breakers together. Shows authorities are on our side. Builds confidence. Um, okay, what kind of a cause are we talking about? Rights of people, rights of workers, to have gainful employment, to make a salary, and feed their families. His manner of speaking is wooden, the tone of his voice bland and uninspired, almost as if compelling, uh, compiling replies from a set of learned phrases. I don't think I've chosen any sites yet. Might be time. Don't let the fat bastards tread on you. Cops tend to side with the higher-ups, but you're essentially still workers. I don't trust cops, but I can see you understand the right to work! Right to work! Okay, I've got some questions for you. Maybe you should ask them the questions. Like why we're not allowed to make a living here. Shame on you! We have families to feed, you piece of shit. He points his finger at the man sitting on the railing. So do we, scab. The loitering man hollers in return. What is a strike? When a bunch of ungrateful, lazy cockroaches can't get their act together, decide to block honest work for other people. He shifts uncomfortably in his workers' overalls. What do the strikers want? Beats me! They mumble nonsense about boardrooms and workers' rights while we... 
have the right to work. He raises his fist and starts shouting again. There's something odd in the way he carries himself. His set of clothing looks vaguely mismatched. The different pieces of the attire seem ill-fitting. Ill -fitting. Um, okay. What does it mean? His shirt is far too small and an unpleasantly tight fit, while the overalls held up by a belt seem to fit a man with much more corpulence. You wearing new clothes? He ignores your question, choosing instead to turn to the emaciated workers, raising both fists in the air. The clothes are obviously not his. Silence is the answer. There's something off here, but you won't say what. Okay, who are all these strike breakers? Honest men and women. Rights to work. To be useful, not toys for corporate interests. The man runs a hand through his steadily graying military haircut. We came here to find harbor run smooth to help the harbor run smoothly in times of crisis. If union fucks don't want work, they ought to let those who want to work let in those who want to work. I have a question, Lieutenant looks him in the eye. Why do these men follow your leadership? You think they follow me because I'm big and loud? No, they follow the rules of the market. The rules of economy, because they were given a job to do. You've been talking to him for quite a while now. Something is off for the guy. Ask him where he's from. Okay, I gotta ask, where exactly are you from? What's it to you? Deep set suspicion drips from every syllable. Curiosity. I'm gonna figure out this strike mess. Big mess, caused by union greed. He shoots you a wary, distrustful look. But I only fight for the rights of people. Every once in a while, it looks like you can see glimpses of another guy under the guise of this fighter for jobs. He seems to be more brutal, cunning, and suspicious. A more brutal, cunning, and suspicious person. Just a hunch. Or you might be paranoid. Um, already got that. I'm interested in your background. We're all workers, right? Workers stick together. Come from the eminent domain in Jamrock. Backgrounds in odd jobs, heavy lifting, cargo haul, and bouncer work. I know the drill. Um, a bouncer? Where? I frequent a lot of bars. Maybe it's one I know. Worked at Territorial. Ring a bell? Yeah, I think I've been there. Uh-huh. Well, it was a long time ago. The man is losing, quickly losing interest in talking to, with you. Uh, what's your goal here? We were promised work, he points to the gates. We'd be work in there working if the bastard doesn't shut the gate. Uh, and you're unable to breach the entrance. Main gate's locked. Would take every ordinance to bust it open. Could try get in through the secretary's office. He points up the stairs. Door's locked. Guards blocking the way to the access panel. I don't mean scrawny mess punk either. He points to the dock worker idling on the staircase. I mean head measurer or whatever he is. Wait, head measurer? Huge seminese guy. Standing, on, uh, standing up there on the overhead passage. Won't let anyone by. Access panel's right behind him. How bad could one guy be? You seem capable. Bad, the man glares at you. Standing on a narrow bridge, he's got strategically advantageous position, and he's trained. I don't know how Union has trained up a, a... I don't know how Union has a trained up killer up there, but that's one's no joke. My workers are tired or hungry. They're workers, not fighters. Why you just talk to them? Like civilized folk, you mean? The man rubs his chin. These naive fucks don't understand civilized. It would be better for the neighborhood if you went home, at least for now. You can't get in anyway. No. They will give up eventually, or get drunk, leave the button on guard, and then we charge. The man rubs his jaw. Perfect, light, uh, lightly bearded square wedge. Alright, I want to get into the harbor too. Have fun, he snorts. Union shits are on full strike. Don't think they're going to let you through the gates. You trying to meet their fat boss? Um, I'm interviewing people about a murder that took place here behind the hostile cafeteria there. Oh, nothing about a murder. His reply is snappy and terse. The mention of killing uh, sends a barely noticeable shiver of tenseness through him. Interesting. Why so tense? What are you talking about? I'm not tense. Yes, he's tense. Right to work. He again shakes his fist and turns back to you. It's shameful, cops doing nothing. You should bring back up. Open gates for us. Blockading gainful employment for workers is a crime. Um, 
This really isn't my area of expertise. We're not picking a side in this just yet, sir. It pity. He turns around and bells at the gate. Let us work. Right, I'm gonna leave for now. So we need to get through the gates and they're not letting anyone through. Fair enough. And that's the big guy up there. It says G R I H. The Great Revishal Industrial Harbor. And that's how we would get up there to the button that we should open the gates. Got it. Okay. Let's keep exploring. The lorries probably stored fuel here, now they store booze. Ooh. Intriguing. What's up here? Um, a lorry stuck in traffic jam. This big, heavy, grad-made machine is well kept for such an old machine. Look in the window. The windows are clear. They've been recently washed. You can see a lorryman's cabin with personal belongings, stickers, insignia. What kind of stickers are insignia? The driver is adorned his space with a substantial collection of peculiar paraphernalia. Proclamations about honor, strength, and purity are glued to various panels. A large metal pendant hangs from the rearview mirror. The pendant features a sun crowned with wavy rays. It is the seal of Royalist Era Revachol. And the back seat? The back end of the cabin has a small perch to sleep, large ashtrays. There are several suns and wheels sewn into the curtains. Racist nationalist paraphernalia, he grits his teeth. Not unusual in this part of town, this is our guy. The lieutenant nods towards the racist lorry driver. Think this lorry belongs to our tough guy? Likely, yes. This guy is proud of who he is, drapes it all over his machine. Okay, interesting. This one? A foreign car kept in good condition. Astas Rajko, one of the finest Zaimsk. Ziemsk? Ziemsk? Something like that? Made motor car carriages ever, an oldie but a goodie. Who drives these? Not many people outside Grad and Revishol West, too, it appears. Hey, Kim, check this out. Is that Rechko KK2? That is a classic model. The lieutenant replies with a nod. Never thought I'd see another one repainted after what happened last time. Um, hold on, maybe I can impress him. Do I know what happened last time? No, only that the motor carriage is typically baby blue, the colours of uh, Zygismund the Great, an ancient Zymsk uh, ruler. His banners were famously Zafar and White, the colours of the Staz Rajko. Uh, let me guess what happened last time, Kim. Blue and white are the colours of the Zmisk. Someone painted it and got Zmisk uh, mad and boom, murder happened? Oh, that's, well, yes, exactly. It more or less, except it was a crowd of them. Tore him out the vehicle and ran him over with his own tyres. They said it was an honour killing. Hussar style, the Zmisk community protested the trial, flying the colours. He shakes his head. 5,000 came to protest. Correction, 4,395, the fourth largest public protest of a criminal trial in Revishal. I'm not going to bring that up. Who are the Zimisk uh, community? People were prayed to protect. Lieutenant shakes his head. Let's leave it at that. What they sentenced the killers to? He studies the ref uh, refle his reflection in the mirror in... He studies his reflection in the car window. Four years for murder in reunion. Lieutenant shrugs. The perps were remorseful. The sorry knocked off eight knocked eight years off their sentence. That's the system. The prisons in the Greater Revishal Industrial Harbor are already full. Prisoners are expensive to maintain. The longer the sentence, the larger the cost. Could our hanged man have been the owner of this car? Dri well, driver of this car? Could it be another Stash Rajko murder? He gives you a crooked smile. Honestly, that doesn't seem like the type of vehicle our dead dive would drive, so my initial guess is the two are not related. Intr I don't have an opinion on the paint job. Well, actually, before we proceed, I've got an opinion on this paint job. Yes, detective. They should have left it baby blue. 
You sure you're not Zymisk? Uh, he shares a smile with you only for a second. Yes, you're sure you're not. Or if you are, it's only in that Revisholian way. 4 to 5% maximum. Okay, interesting. So we got a foreign car, so there's some kind of foreigner around here. Maybe the car belongs. Ooh, money. Maybe the car belongs to the person who's leading the people trying to stop the strike? Maybe. Would seem odd, though. What else have we got here? Memorial? Horseback Monument. An old monument stands in the middle of the traffic island, pointed towards the sea. It looks as if it's been reassembled piece by piece, secured and mounted in the air with the aid of numerous ropes and rods. Who is this? A silver plaque on the statue's pedestal reads, I am Philippe III, the squanderer, the greatest of the Philippian kings of Revachol, son of Philippe II, the opulent, father of Philippe IV, the insane. As you look up, you notice something about the statue. There are some odd indentations on the king's chest piece. What did this king do? Even by the standards of the Philippian kings, old Sumptius Philippe was known for his uh, prof uh, profligacy. In what way? Well, he blew, through, he blew through the whole national treasury, starting the decline of one of the most one of the penultimate century's greatest superpowers, the suzerain of Revishal. Is that profligy? Uh, profligacy. Profligacy, I think that's meant to be. Yes, anyway. His own uh, maladministration foreshadowed the fall of the monarchy during the Anticentennial Revolution at, and an end to his family line and the monarchy on the Insulindian Isola. Sorry, I got a little tongue-tied there. Um, how did he manage to blow through the entire national treasury? Stories have it that he had his bedroom converted into a treasure chamber where he stored unfathomable wealth. Krugerrands, bars of gold, ornate weaponry, armor, and various chalices. He called it the Sol Ar um, Urum. It was obscene. There were whispers he slept on a huge pile of gold-dipped uh, feathers like some obese dragon instead of a bed like a normal per person. Okay. Um, wait, really? There's no way that's true. But wait, you haven't even heard about his fabled cocaine addiction. The what now? You see, old Philippe wasn't just good at squandering the national treasury on gold and ceremonial weaponry. He was also a prestigious snorter of nose candy. Okay. Um, okay, what is nose candy? Cocaine. Oh, good, yes. Um, this is a lot to process. His Majesty's courtiers said that it helped him connect with the higher realms. So he was addicted to nose candy, a bloated druggie. That's what the revolutionary said 150 years later, right before they emptied out the royal mausoleum and dumped his Majesty's mortal remains in the Insulindian Bay. Okay, so where is he buried now? Beneath the cold waters of the Insulindian Bay, thrown there by the revolutionaries after they cleaned out the royal mausoleum. Onto the statue. The original was blown apart by uh, Comenards, then further damaged during the landing of the Coalition's airships during the turn of the century revolution, when the Martinez was levelled. Most historians think the Coalition's hasty landing may have ultimately saved the statue. If the Comenards had more time, they would have reduced it up into even finer pieces. Who restored the monument? Some years ago, a group of liberal, artistically inclined individuals, designers mostly, thought it would be ironic to restore the statue of the most wasteful ruler of Revachol in the poorest part of the city. The statue was supposed to capture the moment it was blown apart like an instant frozen in time, a rare butterfly trapped in amber floating on a sea of shit. I kind of like it, it's brilliant, so funny and nihilistic. People in Martinez tend to disagree, as do many prominent art critics and thought leaders with more nuan nuanced social awareness than the young uh, ironists. Philippe III, the squanderer, however, with his bronze face up in the air, doesn't seem concerned about what the hoi polloi think of him in death. Not that he ever did in life, either. What indentations? What do I see? Something with great kinetic energy seems to have impacted the cuirass, around where the heart is. A bullet? 
Someone shot him in the heart. Interesting. Lieutenant, has someone shot the king? Okay. He cleans his glasses before looking up. I can't see it, but I'll take your word for it. What do you think? Well, Martinez is riddled with bullet holes. This place saw a lot of action during the uh, revolution. But this statue is recently renovated, so maybe a joke, target practice, or a political statement. Um, well, none of the above. Maybe it's connected to the murder. If we connect every bullet hole in Martinez to the murder, we'll get an overwhelming amount of loose threats. He takes his notebook out. But then again, we don't really know what we're dealing with here, so... He takes a note. I've made a note. Don't hold your breath. The king stands high above you, surveying the bay, mute and indifferent to your sightings. We'll leave. Okay. What if we go over here? Uh, we have a bold slogan, Cubanox covers the truck. Okay. Nothing else over there. Ooh, a box. That's my box now. White tank top, plus one physical instrument. Wait, what am I currently wearing? I'm currently wearing one that gives me plus one drama. Do I lose drama for the ability to be physically strong? Nah. No, nah, I'll, I'll just use that if I ever need to do be physically strong. What about in here? What's in here? Yeah, that's mine now. Ooh, nice. Who are you? That is an epic picture. Small wrinkled woman does not greet you. She nods along to something on her radio. A photograph is clutched in her hands and there is a warm smile on her face. The photo, an ambrotype from the turn of the century, as golden as her smile. It's the warmth of a winter's night fa fire. Maybe she could give you comfort and shelter, some cigarettes and food money. Maybe she's your... Grandma? Nothing. Her smile just keeps widening. Her grey hair is grey like lead. Um, excuse me, ma'am, I'd like to ask some questions. No response. Whatever this woman is, your words fail to reach her. I'm going to snap my fingers in front of her face. If you want her attention, you may need to be more forceful. Do it twice. Where am I? Who are you? Like a magician recalling a subject from hypnosis, you've jolted her back to reality. The smile on her face has disappeared, replaced by the weary aspect of a cornered beast. Uh, you're right, ma'am. You were out. Never mind. I remember now. I'm still stuck in the traffic jam. In the 50s. She adds with contempt. Uh, wait. What's so bad about the 50s? The men have small jaws, and everything is made out of the plastic. Why do you need plastic when you can make the world out of amber? Um, when else would you have been then? Back in Mefke, during the time of the revolution. The sidewalks and coffees are filled with young people. I was on my way to see a new boy there, a picture starring Gabriel Buenguerro. Until you come along, that is. She, the look she gives you is accusatory. Who's Gabriel Buenguerro? This is Gabriel Buenguerro. He shows you the photograph in the lavish amber frame. I'll take a look. The strikingly handsome man looks straight at you, his head crowned with a wide brim hat. His hair is dark as an oil slick, and his jaw is the most perfectly chiseled thing you've ever seen. This man's got a hold over her. Even 50 years later, you can feel it. He was the biggest star of his day. Girls used it to faint in the aisles of the cinema whenever he came on the screen, and schoolboys used it to memorize all his lines. She leans back, savoring the world she's conjured up. In all likelihood, it's a world that only existed in her mind. So you, you were in Mesk when you were really young. Someone was. She nods as though her meaning was perfectly clear. Someone, are these not your memories? They are someone's memories, boy. What difference does it make if it's me or not? They are beautiful. That is all that matters, beautiful and true. And they will win. They are coming for this, you know. All of this. She seems to derive some bitter pleasure from this strange thought. As if the past will one day wipe the present away, like a tidal wave approaching. Uh, sorry to interrupt your dreaming, ma'am. I wasn't dreaming. I was there, low man. It was early spring, and the man behind the black sun had just come out. 
The posters were 20 meters tall. Everything was gold. Her eyes narrow and she appears to take your measure. While you people were tearing each other apart over your petty little revolution. In Metke, it was a golden age. The Republic of Mesca is a massive confederation on the Isola of Mundi, the world's largest state by territory. It's a petrol state, a constitutional monarchy, and as of recently, an outcast due to its tilt to the far right. Right, I have some que other questions for you. Please, questions. Why not, Rife? It's not like I have anything better to do in this hellhole. She settles back against the railing of her motor lorry. Behind her, mountains of memorabilia, photos, and knickknacks line the dashboard. There's something off about this woman. Um, tell her to show you the soles of her boots. Maybe she was at the hanging somehow. Can I see the soles of your boots? Now what do you want with an old woman's boots, Zarefe? Um, it's for important police business, ma'am. She raises her boots slowly with contempt and says, I'm starting to think you should not let me get back to Gabriel Munguero. You're no Gabriel. He's uh, wearing sturdy worker's boots made of black leather. Buckles run across. The sole is also made of leather. Now the other one, please. Just before Gabriel, it was the coronation of Frank Conegro. Now there was a real man. There was no uh, aberration in the pattern that you can see. She puts her foot down. Moreover, the boots were size 37, tiny. There are too many discrepancies in all this. Another discrepancy, although not boot related, is that the coronation of his innocence, Frank Conge Con Conegro, which happened um, 500 years ago. Wait, what do you mean it was the... Um, well, hmm. What do you mean it was uh, the coronation of Frank Conegro? It was, she shrugs, and then it was no more, and I was no longer holding my father's hand. He was no longer the standing in the stairs and rail. The crowd had gone silent. Perhaps it was another Zef, Zerefe who came and woke me up looking at my boots asking questions, or perhaps it was one of the others in this uh, carnival. I don't remember. As she says, carnival, she gestures to the empty square with the statue and the machines. She is not old soul. These are not the boots that made the prints. He takes a quick note. I could have told you that just from looking at them. Her size is 37. The feet of a little girl. She smiles. They fit well on the pedals. What are you hauling? Diamonds. Diamonds, really? Of course not. She says, grinning. But it wouldn't be. But it wouldn't be marvelous if I was. Okay, but what are you really hauling? She shrugs. Whatever stupid thing they put in the lorry, I imagine. So you don't know what you're hauling in your own lorry? I quit concerning myself of that a long time ago. She smiles with a careless smile. Besides, I don't drive the lorry for cargo if you know what I mean. Uh, what if the cargo is contraband? Then it's contraband, lawman. What? You want to take an old woman in? Be my guest. Lock me away like bad hand Herman Gildo. Bad hand Herman Neg Hermine Gildo. Bad hand str strangled 300 people. What can I say? Some people just really like strangling people. I don't really understand this whole uh, Boadero Gabriel Bungaro thing. Of course you do not. To truly really understand the Boadero, you need to listen to On the Western Plain. A Boadero. Boa, for short, is a cow herder from upstream Magret, is uh, the great steps of the northern Meh, Mesque. Uh, the way she said it was like Meh, Mesque, something like that. I was saying Mesque before. Anyway, whatever. He is a rugged individualist and explorer. Um, okay, what's that? It's an old ballad about a young girl who falls in love with a daring Boadero. He promises to marry her as soon as he reaches. He returns from the western plain. Um, I guess that doesn't happen. Of course not. The Boadero returns from the western plain, a changed man. One night, as he and his beloved are out walking along the river Magret, 
She pleads with him to give up his riding and settle down. In the background, you can hear the orchestra swell as the screen fills with the maiden's imploring eyes. I think I can see where this is going. So the Beradero strangles his beloved and throws her body in the Magret. Then he rides off because the Western Plain is calling him. That is not where I thought it was going. You have to understand, a true Boradero needs a whole horizon to himself. He can't be tied down by man or woman. His beloved was selfish. She didn't know what it meant to love a Boadero. What if to truly love a Boadero is to float lifeless uh, to is to float lifeless downstream? Before I came you seemed away. She is just a distracted old woman. Perhaps we should let her get back to things. So he doesn't think she's the smuggler. You hear that, lawman? Don't think your partner likes you spending too much time with me. Um, wait, why is that, Lieutenant? Nothing, I just don't think she's connected to anything. He doesn't want your frail mind caught up in something here. Something unconnected to the case, but connected to this woman tuning out like that. Should I drive a lorry if you get like that? Oh, don't worry about me. I'm one of the best communeers around. I drive routes no one else will. What routes? Lomonosov's land, Udashanea, Zimilia, the western plain. She nods and closes her eyes again, letting her mind submerge. The trans Catla uh, Magistral, U41A, has Estradas du Merador, all the good ones, the deep trenches where the bluebirds fly. She opens her eyes again and shudders. Um, well, cool, Ryan, right till you're dust, sister. Romeo, she breathes out. I already am dust. You seem like a woman who knows a thing or two about drugs. What do I need drugs for, lawman? What I see, what I feel, the great adversary. No drugs can compare. The adversary? Yes, there is a... Protagonista. She points to the in intersection. And an adversario. I am on the side of the adversary. There is no coming back from that hall. Those epitaphs are familiar somehow. The great adversary, the great unrest. Um, Where can I get my hands on an experience like that? If you don't know. Pah, she flicks her wrist in a gesture of casual dismissal. Maybe she, if she thought you're corrupt. I wanted to ask if you'd be interested in smuggling some drugs. Why would I want to do that? Um, for the glory of the World Republic. Liberation of the spirit and body. Lawman. What in the name of God are you talking about? Biggest c communism builder achievement unlocked. Okay, let me put this another way. Are you smuggling drugs through Terminal B? Her shoulder bones crack as she shrugs. Maybe. Probably not. Makes no difference to me either way. Um, okay. You said earlier you don't know what cargo you're hauling. Could it be drugs? Just this month I made ha half a dozen trips from Samariza to Grad on the U-41A. What do you think they take from... Sarah Merza to grad, Lawman. Drugs? No, Lawman. Diamonds, she grins. Okay. I didn't know. Uh, if I, you had to guess, who do you think smuggling drugs around here? Easy. It's the skinny man who thinks he's a poet. Never trust a poet. He squints across the square. Also, he's the only one I can see from here. That's correct. There is no visibility of the others. I didn't ask you about diamonds, did I? I don't care about that. Diamonds are good for you, lawmaker. You should try them some of the time. Make yourself pretty like Deva Deshuras. Okay, you're not involved with drug trafficking, then why are you waiting here? Where do you want me to go? This isn't so bad, so I can listen to music or the seagulls. Look at the colors and the features of this world. It's a good palate cleanser, this jamboree. 
or I could just relax and let my mind carry me back to where it will, to the Great Plains. I think we're done here, no? He closes his notebook to stress it. Thank you. See ya. Yes, go. Enough jamboree. Needs to get back to Mesca. She, her voice trails off. Okay. So, nothing. Pretty much is what we got there. We still have a level up. I'm aware of that. I'm very aware we have a level up. In fact, I'm so aware I'm running somewhere. I'm running all the way around here. We're going to get my coat back. I'm ready. It's coat time. That's not the way to the coat. Coat is this way. I still need to know how to get up there. Must be in her room somehow you can get up there. I don't know. Anyway. Quickly hop our way through this little bit. Uh, and hopefully we'll get to where we're going. So up here. Then we're going all the way over to the coat. I'm going to check, just double check that we haven't unlocked something for the coat. Because we might have, from speaking to Kuno, unlocked something that would let us uh, get, get the coat back. Yeah, I'm running now. Good. Right. Coat. Oh, we got something. Backed by physical instrument. Do it. We did it. Savoir faire passed. As you leap in the as you leap in the air, a chilly breeze engulfs you, sharpening your senses. Um I'm gonna close my eyes, let the senses take in the world around me. Ankles tingling from the uh, tension, blood roaring in your ears. You're ready for your rendezvous of the concrete pavement below. Continue the voyage through the salty air. As the concrete floor welcomes you, you realize it's been a while since you felt so alive, alert, capable. It must be the adrenaline. I knew you could do it, Lieutenant exclaims. My climbing down might not have been as disco as your jump, but at least we can explore the harbor now. With your feet firmly placed on, uh, planted on the concrete, the noise of the harbor rushes back in. My coat? It's my coat. It gives me plus one esprit de corps and plus one shivers. What is shivers when it's at home? Shivers. Raise the hair on your neck, tune into the city. Oh, spider senses. Shivers comes when the temperature drops um, and you become keenly aware of your surroundings. It enables you to hear the city itself, to truly belong to the streets. It is a supernatural ability. The old wrongs play out in present time. Scenes across the city happen in front of you, but who is speaking to you? At high level, shivers may make you seem mad to the outside world. As you listen to the city, you don't listen to others. Your superiors may begin to, begin to worry. With low shivers, though, you will seldom hear the city speaking to you. If you cannot hear it, how can you save it? Ooh, okay. Well, uh, I'm definitely putting on my new coat. Well, my old coat. What's my current one give me? Suggestion minus half life, minus one half life. Oh yeah, I'm definitely putting on the coat. Look at that. A police cloak made from heavy tarpaulin would be na um, nigh wind and waterproof if there weren't um, three bullet holes scattered on the surface. The signature white rectangle of the RCM covers the garment's back. Oh, it's good to be in our coat. That is fantastic. We have something that's collecting rainwater, and you know, I think this is a good point to end the episode. We've got our PI hat, we've got our detective's coat. We're ready to go. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.